Welcome to our National Whistleblower Day celebration. I am so excited to have you here. My name is Siri Nelson. I am the Executive Director at National Whistleblower Center. And this is the biggest day of our year, National Whistleblower Day. The day we get the privilege of celebrating whistleblowers, their legacies, and their incredible contributions to our society, democracy, and the stability of our economies. I'm so excited to be here today. It is the third day of our three-day celebration this year. So we've been all virtual this year. You've been able to interact with us in the chat. We've had some wonderful remarks from legislators and regulators on day one. We heard from the House Ombuds Office, the House Office of the Whistleblower Ombuds, the North American Securities and Ministers Association, and Senator Grassley. So that was a really big day for us. We had tons of visitors. So thank you so much to anybody who's returning from that day. Yesterday was our International Whistleblowing Day. It was incredibly informative. We started off with a member of the French National Assembly, Hugo Bernasiles, and then we went on to a wonderful panel with Stephen Cohn and two Harvard Business School professors who studied the impact of rewards on whistleblower intentions and how they make the decision about coming forward. That conversation was so rich with academic insights and you can revisit that when we post the video on our website on YouTube later. Then we heard from whistleblowers. So that was our first whistleblower panel of our event. It was incredible. We had whistleblowers from around the world. We had Johannes Stephenson, Yasmin Mochiremi, and Ari Danikis. They were all so open and insightful about their experiences. And interestingly, although their experiences came from around the world, they did share some very big similarities, like the desire to speak up, a commitment to justice, and the tenacity to survive retaliation. So today, I'm really, really excited to have us continue on that thread of whistleblowing. We also heard from Alfred Brunel yesterday. He's an environmental defender, and he announced yesterday that he also identifies as a whistleblower. His remarks were so powerful and helped us all understand the value of environmental defenders, the reality that all environmental defenders are whistleblowers and the importance of increasing our protections for those environmental defenders and whistleblowers, especially those who are coming forward to speak up about wildlife crime violations, such as wildlife trafficking. Today is our final day of our celebration. It is National Whistleblower Day. We have over a thousand people who have RSVP for our event. So we're happy to see you all here. And thank you to our generous donors who have helped us reach our fundraising goal. Today, you will hear from Stephen Cohn and Jane Turner on the story of National Whistleblower Day. Then Jane Turner will continue with whistleblower experiences, life after whistleblowing. And then we'll hear from some early career whistleblower attorneys about how they plan to build on the legacies of their mentors. And finally, we will wrap up with some incredible remarks from Dr. Allison Gill, a whistleblower who is also a podcaster and has an incredible story. So now let's get kicked off with Stephen Cohn and Jane Turner telling the amazing story of how we learn about the true meaning of National Whistleblower Day. Good afternoon. My name is Jane Turner. I am an FBI whistleblower. My daughter, Victoria, who has been around whistleblowers all her life and now works with Whistleblower Network News, told me, keep it short, mother. Do not get into Stephen Cohn's time. But it is hard to keep it short about a giant. There are too few giants for whistleblowers today. Stephen Cohn and Senator Grassley are two who come to mind. Stephen Cohn has been a whistleblower lawyer for 35 years. Most people know that, but don't know Stephen Cohn sprang from the fertile soil of an activist mother, Corinne Cohn. Did you know his family has joined him together in a whistleblower advocacy journey? He established the National Whistleblower Center and Cone Cone and Cala Pinto with his brother Michael, sister Estelle, and law partners Mary Jane Wilhelm and David Cala Pinto. They've been at the forefront of creating and helping implement whistleblower law and advocacy. Not only whistleblowing, but Stephen Cone has another love besides his wife Leslie, a love of history and history books that was ignited and encouraged by Howard Zinn. Yes, that Howard Zinn, 
many years ago at Boston College, where Stephen was a student. Professor Zinn inspired him, along with many other people. Stephen Cohn believes you can use the past to inspire the present. That is what led him to research the original whistleblowers from, 19, from 1777 to 1778. That research led to Senator Grassley's adoption and communicating the research. Today, the story is ubiquitous. I have personally seen books and heard speeches noting his research without attribution. I ask him if that doesn't annoy him or bother him, and he notes he's only, he's only uh, good with the historical research that was painstakingly done. It was to inspire people, to inspire a movement, to merge history with the future of whistleblowers. That, my friends, is a giant. I present to you Stephen Cohn and the history of National Whistleblower Day. Stephen? Thank you, Jane. That is quite the introduction. Uh, I hope most of it's true. So <laughs> the, uh, just the one, uh, just one point is uh, Howard Zinn and I, we were together at Boston University, not college. So we have to give the right school credit. They were pretty close to each other. Definitely. Sorry about Thank that, you. Stephen. I went to a college. Don't even worry Sorry. About that. It was a great introduction. Um, I don't you. know what else I can say except for uh, try not to blush. So go ahead, Stephen. Tell us the facts and what led you into this. And uh, it is quoted everywhere. I mean, I was just down in North Carolina and somebody got up on the stage and gave the whole story straight out of your speech it wasn't attributed. So I, I wonder how you feel about that. Well, it, you know, the, the whole point is to have people recognize what the founders of this country did and not necessarily, you know, credit. I mean, you, one would hope you put it out there and people would just pick it up. So I really don't have a sense of ownership. It's really, I'm happy that people are promoting it, celebrating it. Uh, from my perspective, you know, my name does not need to be attached at all. You know, it should be celebrated. I'd love to see it celebrated in churches and union halls and uh, organizations, government entities around the country. Uh, but I just got to tell a little bit because I think there's some credit where credit is due. And we can start with Howard Zinn, who was my professor and also professor for my partner, Dave, back in the 1970s in Boston University. And Zinn, who's the author of The People's History, had a philosophy that history should inspire current action. You know, there's a quote from Frederick Nietzsche, which he would use, which is, you know, his quote was, history can be the dead burying the living. Whereas, from Howard Zinn's perspective, the role of history was the exact opposite. Look at the past and gain inspiration. So in 1999, the constitutionality of the False Claims Act was challenged by the Chamber of Commerce and the enemies of whistleblowing and accountability. They claimed that only the government can enforce the laws and empowering the people to help enforce the laws was unconstitutional. And the False Claims Act empowers whistleblowers through QUITAM to, to take action. And it rewards them if they do with a monetary reward. And these folks were saying, no, go through appropriations. You know, you need to hire federal employees to do this. And they really, they want to use every technical argument to shut down whistleblowers and their right to obtain compensation. Because they knew if they could knock that out, they could knock out the law. Went up to the US Supreme Court. No one knew what would happen. So we wrote a brief. And as we researched the brief, 
I, I went to, I had a slew of law clerks. We often have a lot. My sister, you mentioned Estelle, who passed some years ago, but she'd recruit tons of great clerks. I said to him, I called a meeting. I said, look, during the American Revolution, which is kind of the founding of our republic and, and really is the intent behind the formation of our country, I said, I, I bet you the Continental Congress or some of our revolutionary founders called upon the people to act. Can you dig something up? Can you find it? They went out and searched and came up with a resolution, which is now the predicate of National Whistleblower Day. The, res the first whistleblower law ever. And we'll talk about that later on. Put it in the brief. Then as I now look at my notes, it was around 2007, I'm doing research for my book, the whistleblower's handbook. And I decide and it's really what Zinn would say, you know, it's not just a resolution. It's not just the fact that the Continental Congress did something. From Howard Zinn's perspective, remember he wrote the people's history. He said, there had to be people behind this. That's what he would have said. And I said, yeah, maybe there really were whistleblowers. Were there whistleblowers back in 1777, 1778, United States? Why else would they pass this resolution? So I started researching and went into the records of the Continental Congress and lo and behold, there were whistleblowers. And then I said, holy Toledo. And then I called my clerks, you know, I had them run a Library of Congress, Rhode Island Historical Society, National Art, let's build this. And I just wanted, I have a couple of things that this is the type of stuff they were finding and digging out or we're doing, these are the actual original letters and notes. And this is one that I'm gonna to announce today that I dug out. I mean, I've been, we're still researching this. And this one I got literally, I dug it out. It was identified uh, on Monday because I knew, I knew what was, that, that Samuel Adams, one of the most important revolutionary leaders that created our country, I knew he was intimately involved, but I needed absolute confirmation. I saw a reference to him in the, na the name of Sam, S-A-M Adams. Had to be Samuel Adams, I figured. So we finally, finally got the confirmation. This is the letter from Samuel Adams archives, his a letter to the whistleblowers themselves. Just, and, and it's funny, it's discussing payment and like, uh, because the Continental Congress allocated money. So, so what I'm saying is we, we dug, we dug everywhere we can and we're still digging to recreate this story. And why, why recreate the story? because it's the story of 10 sailors and Marines. And when we look at their behavior, it is almost identical to what you see in whistleblowers today. You know, the words they use are the same words that you hear from whistleblowers today. And I'm just, this is a letter they wrote in 1777, their initial whistleblower allegation. We are desirous of being active in defense of our constitutional liberties. Now, this is how you start putting together history. 1777, the whistleblowers are demanding that their constitutional liberties be honored. But there was no American constitution. There was no Bill of Rights. How can these 10 sailors and Marines be demanding constitutional protection? When the government just formed six months ago. So we just start putting the pieces together and here's what we find. We find that they were working on, they had identified that the commander of the United States Navy was corrupt, was mistreating prisoners, was failing to do his duties. So these are 10 sailors and Marines on a ship 
that are deciding to expose and blow the whistle on the, the big boss, the commander of the Navy appointed by the Continental Congress, whose brother had served as governor of Rhode Island and was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. And they're gonna blow the whistle on him. And what do they do? They look towards their constitutional liberties. And that's the first clue that Samuel Adams was a major player here. Because Samuel Adams was an advocate of what was known as the common law constitution. That as, you know, natural rights, that there are, are constitutional rights that every single American had. And that's the predicate, the, the foundation of our Bill of Rights. That's where it comes from. These are the very origins. So these 10 sailors and Marines sign out a petition. They appoint one of their members, jumps ship, without any permission, jumps ship, travels from Rhode Island to the, to the Continental Congress in Philly. And presents testimony. And, and again, we dug out his actual testimony before the Marine Committee of the Continental Congress when he was questions and the answers he gave. And the guy's a whistleblower. They ask about the petition. They say about the conduct. He talks about the problems he had. And, and they present the peti petition signed by all, every single one of the 10 sellers and Marines. And I always like to tell so you know, we all know what happened, what happened, what happened? Did they hang him, shoot him, whatever? No, they fired the commander in chief. First they suspended him and then they fired him. Uh, the whistleblowers did the right thing. But the story doesn't end there because the, the, the commander of the Navy, this chap named Hopkins, he's a little pissed off. So first off, when before he is notified, he's been relieved of command, he court-martials the one whistleblower he knows, a chap named Marvin, Richard Marvin. He court-martials him. And we have the transcript of the court-martial. And it was very fair because Hopkins, who was, the, who was now the target of the whistleblower allegations, of course, he ran the court-martial. And it's all about who else signed the petitions, who are the other whistleblowers? They're grilling them. Who are those whistleblowers? And Marvin refuses to answer the questions. He says, I will answer the questions posed by the Congress, but not by you. He's found guilty, court-martialed, thrown out of the Navy. Okay, then as the story unfolds, Hopkins, files what's known as a criminal libel suit against all 10 whistleblowers. But he can only capture two of them. And in those days, he can go to jail for a criminal libel. And two are arrested, thrown into jail in Providence, and they write a letter to the Congress pleading for help. And again, this letter could have been written by any whistleblower today. It's amazing. Here's what they write. Your petitioners not being of affluent fortunes, and whistleblowers generally aren't among the millionaire billionaire class, but young men who spent their time in service of their country. Whistleblowers always kind of view themselves in service of their country, be it corporate or government. They have a sense of right and wrong of patriotism. Being in arms against its cruel enemies, they were fighting the British. But then here's some key words, arrested for doing what they believed and still believe was nothing but their duty. I ask, <laughs> I mean, the whistleblowers out there who are listening, you know what I'm talking about because I've heard it a thousand times. I was just doing my job. This is my duty. And then listen, they go on. Now they're held to bail, high bail, in a state where they're strangers without connections to assist them against a powerful enemy. This is essentially the, the constant class nature 
of whistleblowing. You have a worker, an employee, someone without a lot of resources, generally against someone with a lot of money, a big corporation, a government institution or something. It's never equal. And they plead to Congress for help. And what occurs with their plea? Congress passes the first whistleblower law in history, I think in world history, that, that actually lays it out as a real whistleblower law. And, and it's now celebrated, but I, you have to read it. You have to read it on Whistleblower Day. It should be read but everywhere on Whistleblower Day. This is, not, this is part of our heritage, our culture, our history. And this is what it says. That is the duty of all persons. Now, this is amazing. So he's not saying men. He's not saying citizens. Persons who are inhabitants. I mean, it would cover immigrants for sure. It probably covers slaves. Now, it's interesting if you tie it back to Samuel Adams, Adams was anti-slavery. So when you look at the founders of the country, there were divisions. But what you're seeing running through this resolution and from the beginning is that part of the revolutionary foundations of America that these folks were, at least from Adam's perspective and others, which I'll get into, were on the anti-slavery side, very much so and we're on this constitutional right to be a dissident, to blow the whistle, to expose wrongdoing. So that's again, was the tip off that Adams had something to do with this. But it goes on, it says, the duty of all persons, listen to this, to give the earliest information to Congress. I mean, blow the whistle as early as you can. And it's funny, that's all reflected in all of our modern whistleblower laws first to file, they want to be early, or any other proper authority. So it's Congress or, or the proper authority of any misconduct, frauds, misdemeanors committed by any person in service of these states. In other words, if you know the command, if it's the commander of the Navy, you can blow the whistle. If it's the president of the Congress, you can blow the whistle. And, it, and I now, in, Upon research, if you read the Declaration of Independence, it does not contain a right of freedom of speech. It might be implicit. All parts, you know, men are created equal with and endowed by certain rights, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. But here they're talking about the right to dissent, the right to expose government misconduct. So you're looking at this origin building on the natural rights, but coming into what we now call the First Amendment, the right to dissent, founded unanimously by our founders. So they did a little more than that. They then voted to pay the attorney's fees of these two whistleblowers. In other words, they were gonna hire lawyers to represent the two whistleblowers and they voted money, 1300 bucks was eventually voted. Very amazing because the Continental Congress didn't have any money. They were, this is the middle of the revolution. They had no money. If they lost the revolution, they all get hung for treason, but they're not buying bullets. They're buying an attorney to represent whistleblowers. It's amazing. And again, this is where it again starts unfolding because the lawyer they hire, this guy Cheney, who had served, and much, I think he was serving as Attorney General of Rhode Island at the time. His father-in-law was a founder, was a signer of the Declaration of Independence from Rhode Island, but also one of the founders of the Rhode Island Abolition Society. And Cheney's son, became the leading minister in the United States for the abolitionist movement as it developed. So it's clearly, and then Hopkins, the, the commander 
whom they were blowing the whistle on, the whistleblowers. He turns out to have been the captain of one of the most notorious slave ships that had a revolt of the slaves on it and just was recorded that it was put down brutally. That's what I, I read. Now, we know that the slave ships were more brutal than can be imagined. How do you put a, a revolt down even more brutally? Than what's on that ship to begin with. I don't even get this, just, uh, you know, very bad. So you can kind of see these divisions and these arguments playing out. But at the end of the day, the Continental Congress unanimously, from north to south, slave and free, backed up these whistleblowers in word and deed, not guilty. They won their case. Okay, <laughs> see, I, I, I had to tell that story, Jane. I wish I had more time to ask me questions. But I think you still, you might be on mute. No, no, it's, it's fine, Stephen. So I, I'd like to know, what are your plans for the future with this research? Are you gonna write a book? Are you gonna go on a speaking tour? What are your plans? Well, we're continuing our research. The fact that we were confirmed Samuel Adams with absolute documentation is a, is a big step forward. But the real plans are to push to have National Whistleblower Day as a day of national recognition. And it's really breaking out. The Senate has passed resolutions every year unanimously since 2013. And, uh, Agencies are beginning to follow suit. Uh, Siri has listed some of them where they're giving speeches, holding celebrations, uh, holding meetings. So some of it is just a email. Some of it is an actual event. Some of it is speeches. Uh, and one of the things we wanna push for as a day of recognition that every single federal agency must call recognition. These whistleblowers, be it the False Claims Act exposing government fraud, be it Dodd-Frank protecting investors and upholding securities laws, be it all the federal employees who risk everything to report waste, fraud, and abuse in their own agencies. These are American heroes. We need to change the culture. We need to look at what the Continental Congress did in 1778 in money, in resolution, unanimously, and we need to celebrate that, and we need to use that as a cultural icon throughout the entire federal government on July 30th of every single year, and it needs to spread. And Stephen, is this a good time to bring up the fact that uh, UI and the National Whistleblower Center and Whistleblower Network News is starting a new initiative this year and we are gonna create some waves for National Whistleblower Day. And we're gonna get everybody on board, everybody. Well, absolutely. And Jane is the best person to help lead this initiative as a 25 year veteran of the FBI as someone who in her career did unbelievable work on behalf of victimized women and children on Native American reservations and also fought, fought corruption and crime, et cetera. She is, she is in many ways the embodiment of these sailors and Marines who, who gave total service to the country, put everything on the line, blew the whistle and know the power of whistleblowing and the importance of what the founders of this country did in 1778. Yes, we've been on this campaign for a number of years, but I'm with you, Jane. I know we're with together with Siri. We're going to take it to a yep. new level. And next yes, year, we are. it's going to be recognized by the federal government, mandatory in every single department of this country. They will recognize the whistleblower. They will celebrate the whistleblower. They will turn the culture around and we will demand it. Yes. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. Yes, we will. Yes, we Thank will. You. Yes, we will. Yes, we you. will. 
Siri, I believe we've got some great whistleblowers no, coming up. Siri, you're very nice. Yes, that we so, will. I'm so yes, happy. Yes, we will. You got to tell that story, Steve. Thank you for all the great and very exciting updates. Those documents are so impressive and all the work you're doing to research this is so impressive. And I want to remind everybody that the story was originally published in this book right here. This book is your essential resource if you need any information about what you should do if you're a whistleblower. Stephen Cohn is the author of it. It's called The New Whistleblower's Handbook. It's available on our website and at kkc.com. You should definitely check it out. I want to make a quick note to the chat and say thank you so much, everybody, for showing up. If you have any whistleblower tips you'd like to share, please be sure to fill out the intake form at whistleblowers.org. You can see in the upper right-hand corner, you can click on get help. That is the only secure way you can share information with a group of attorneys who will evaluate and see if they can get back to you with help. If you put the information in the chat, it will be visible to everyone. You will not benefit from any of those protections. So please make sure to go to whistleblowers.org and click on get help if you have a tip you'd like to share or if you're seeking legal help. If you're still concerned about getting attorney, starting with this book is a great place to start. So go ahead and order it and, and see if we can help you there. I wanna note some of the great agencies that Steve brought up and that are um, already taking the lead in the government. We have the EPA, we have DOL, we have the USDA, we have the Office of Personnel Management. We have so many different offices that are recognizing National Whistleblower Day on their own. HHS has a great social media campaign and the Environmental Protection Agency has a wonderful podcast that you can listen to. So I really wanna celebrate those agencies for coming together and recognizing National Whistleblower Day. On social media today, I can see that tons of different agencies, organizations, companies, and law firms are celebrating and recognizing National Whistleblower Day. So I really want to say thank you to all of those people and let everybody know that the tide is moving in a good direction. We are seeing more support for today and thank you for being here today. I think Steve, uh, you want to say something quickly? Yeah, also, I believe that the SEC has oh, yes. a great statement. Yes, you're right, I'm sorry. Thank you for reminding me. The SEC did issue a great statement and you can read that at their website as well.